I'd like to ask what your thoughts are, especially if you look at the current movement and people trying to flee the war turned country. And, uh, you know, the question would be, how will this impact neighboring countries? Uh, for instance, the likes of Ethiopia, Egypt, and the Sahel. Well, um, Sudan is, a, is occupying a critical space on the African continent. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about, of course, we are concerned about Nigerians who have been trapped there. But uh, there are also a lot of refugees. Uh, many people don't know that Sudan is a transit uh, country, actually. You have a lot of Ethiopians, a lot of Eritreans in their thousands um, in Sudan waiting to transit to, to Europe as refugees. So you have a huge number of um, different nationalities caught up in this, in this conflict. Um, and so it's, it's not going to be easy at all, considering the fact that they are scattered across the country, uh, and also given the nature of the conflict. We are having a conflict in what you call fully built-up environments. They are not fighting in an open field. They are fighting in built-up areas, and that complicates everything. Uh, and you also find that in this kind of environment, even the commanders may not have direct access to their fighting uh, uh, troops on the ground to pass information to them. So when you negotiate with the commanders for access, you also have to factor that you know, uh, into your plans because it takes time sometimes for their own instruction, once they reach an agreement with you, for their own instruction to reach their troops who are actually fighting. Because most of the time, you don't have electricity uh, for those troops to charge their communication devices. And so oftentimes you, you, you have this breakdown. But I, I, I am uh, optimistic that there's been a lot of pressure to have a ceasefire. Initially, it was not exactly working. But uh, the feedback uh, is that uh, the ceasefire is reasonably holding. And that's why you've been able to see uh, various nationals being moved out of the areas badly hit. No, but, but, you know, the consent now is, do you think that this particular uh, need for survival will impact on neighboring countries? And what would the impact be? Do you think it would be positive or negative? And if that's the case, what exactly are we looking at? Uh, the impact of conflict on, on the country in conflict itself and its neighbors is often not positive. Um, but I, I, I can assure you, I don't have enough time to begin to elaborate on what the likely consequences would be. We need, we need so much time to do that. But what I can say straight away is that um, you, you are going to have a dispersal of persons from Sudan itself into all the neighboring countries. If I just draw a quick parallel with the conflict in Liberia and Sierra Leone, for those who can remember, you, you, you will recall that we had a lot of Liberians in Nigeria. You know, imagine how far Liberia is. But we had thousands of Liberians in Nigeria as refugees. So um, you will definitely have, uh, you know, persons being dispersed into neighboring countries. And I think many of these neighboring countries have actually been receiving those who are fleeing from the conflict in the Sudan. Um, now, there are so many other issues associated with the dispersal. You have the strategic ones. The immediate ones are these ones that we're dealing with in trying to get people out of harm's way. But you also have uh, medium to longer term implications on the neighboring countries. You know, you are going to have uh, possibly uh, something which I also have not seen being discussed. Uh, several Sudanese militia uh, who have been disbanded, you know, uh, but who are no longer accounted for. Uh, within the country, probably spilling into neighboring countries and also possibly compounding the security problems there. Uh, and when you talk about this factor, it's important to also recognize the fact that between Nigeria and Sudan, we have only Chad separating us. And um, we have Chad separating us, and then on top of Chad, you have Libya. Libya has already collapsed, and we've already seen the implications of that in Nigeria with regard to the, how it accelerated the Boko Haram crisis. Now, God forbid, if Sudan should collapse, um, I, I don't have time to begin to read up, but I can say to you clearly, there are not less than eight to 10 various militia groups that have been fighting for a very long time, that have um, a, a vast amount of weapons, 
and that can be a big problem, you know, for countries as far afield as the Sahel. If the African Union and the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, IGAD, and perhaps maybe also the United Nations do not step in now and try to mitigate what is happening and find a lasting solution to it. Well, let's quickly move away from that. But you also already know that, uh, you know, drivers were conveying Niger uh, Nigerian students or Nigerians who were in Saudi and in Sudan and at some point had stopped, you know, uh, the trip because of payment issues. Do you think that this could have been handled in a better way instead of leaving the student in a worse situation where these drivers conveying student uh, from Sudan, you know, to a point where they can be picked up or, you know, move back to Nigeria, uh, they, they, they just stop the trip. So the question is, do, do you think yeah. this, this could have been handled differently? I won't be able to answer that directly because I'm not there. I've been in many conflict areas, and I can tell you that things are not always what you see from a, from a distance. Um, number one, when there's a conflict, there's no business. And so when you have a situation like this, where you can hire trucks, those truck drivers are going to charge an astronomical amount of money. I'm not holding brief for anyone. I'm just talking about the reality. Uh, be, not only because um, they may not get another business in a long time, and so they charge as much as they can, given this business that has come their way, but also because of the risks that are involved. Um, and also, I am not too sure who is selling fuel in Sudan at the moment. I don't know how they will get fuel, but this is what they are supposed to take care of. And sometimes you are not able to completely ascertain that the entire chain of that, of the entire logistics chain has not been compromised because you are, in a, you are eager to get your nationals or your citizens or whoever out of, out of the way. And so some of these people might now start playing games even after they've agreed with you on the price. And I'm not saying this is what has happened. I'm just telling you the kind of scenarios you can get. You know, um, Sudan is a vast country. And I think that the, 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 the choice of, of Egypt as an evacuation point from Khartoum, I think is a very good choice, uh, simply because uh, once they get on the road to Meroe, which I think leads to Luxor, which is what I read is the point, I feel the Nigerian evacuees are supposed to be going through, there is the added confidence that Egyptian security forces can provide added security for those on that route. And it is unlikely that the rapid support forces or the Sudanese armed forces will venture towards the Egyptian border to create any problems. So for that reason, I feel it's a good choice to pick that location. But I'm not in a position, like I said, to exactly uh, comment on the logistical arrangements, other than saying that you may not always have a foolproof uh, logistical system in an environment that is in total chaos. Um, hopefully they can sort out the problems that have emerged uh, and root. Mm. And just before we let you go, what lessons do you think that Nigeria can actually learn from this Sudan conflict and crisis? Again, do you think that we have learned anything from you know, past experience uh, that has happened? I mean, with other countries, especially when it has to do with evacuation and you know, response time. Okay, I'll address this from two perspectives. First, let me talk about the government. I think that uh, the management of Nigeria's for, or, the, or the foreign relations of any country is done by the Minister of Foreign Affairs. If you look at what is happening now, we have the Diaspora Commission taking the, the I assume is taking the front lead because it's the one making all the statements and speaking about everything being done. We have the National Emergency Management Agency whose, whose operational area is just the territory of the Federal Republic of Nigeria also making statements. You have the Minister of Foreign Affairs not being very visible. I think we need to correct this straight away. It is the job of the Minister of Foreign Affairs to manage Nigeria's foreign relations. We have citizens trapped in a country. We have an embassy in that country. And even when we want to evacuate our citizens into neighboring countries, we are still going to rely on our embassies in those countries to make all the necessary arrangements. And I assume that they are doing so. But I feel strongly that the Minister of Foreign Affairs should be taking the lead and there should be only one channel of public communication. So we don't confuse the students 
and the Nigerians who are involved in this crisis. There should be one clear channel of communication, and that should be the spokesperson of the Nigerian Minister of Foreign Affairs. I hope that the lessons that have come from here will enhance better preparation going forward. Talking about what Nigerians themselves can learn from this, from my experience working in a number of countries, I found that many Nigerians do not like to register at the Nigerian embassy. You might have up to, say, 10,000 Nigerians in a place, and only 300 will register in the embassy. And when I try to talk to them, to encourage them to go to the embassy and register, they tell you things like, well, what has the country done for me? I don't have any business with them. But then, when there's a crisis, you're expecting the same embassy to know how many of you there are and to have a contingency plan to evacuate you. It's not rocket science. It's not going to be smooth. So my advice will be, every Nigerian citizen outside the territory of this country, go to the Nigerian embassy and register. And in particular, those Nigerians in places like Burkina Faso, Central African Republic, Mali, and other areas that are prone to conflict or are already experiencing conflict, must make sure they go and register in the Nigerian embassy so that, God forbid, if things break down completely, at least the embassy knows how many people there are and those whom it is supposed to plan contingency and make contingency plans for to ease the evacuation should it be necessary. In other words, uh, you know, the uh, diaspora commission you know, shouldn't have been a case. But well, that would be a conversation for some for another time. It's, been, it's, so doing, it's doing a good job. I'm just saying that in the management of our foreign relations, for example, we've had comments from certain officials that should never have been made. Because those such comments can damage relations between Nigeria and other states, in my personal opinion. So it's better to leave this to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. They know the kind of statements to make, and they know how to manage tensions that may arise in this kind of a scenario, in the relationship between Nigeria and those countries. Mm. Well, the Diaspora Commission is, 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 is not, you know, an illegal uh, commission. I mean, it, it has some legitimacy of government as well. But like I said, it will be a conversation for some other time. Thank you so much, Adebayo Luwake. Hello. Hope you enjoyed the news. Please do subscribe to our YouTube channel and don't forget to hit the notification button so you get notified about fresh news updates.